this evening, ladies and gentlemen, could only take place in America. And like David, I am, I am completely overwhelmed and, um, and intimidated by the quality of the speakers and by the depth of the humanity. And Min, you have made me feel Korean. And Hala, you have made me feel Palestinian. And you have all made me feel very proud to be an American. <laughs> And, and Min, I also thank you for giving me permission to be emotional because uh, Dayton is, is, is a place that's, that's so full of emotion for me. But before I go on to speak about Richard Holbrook and, and what he did here in Dayton, and I was privileged to be by his side, we were, we were relatively newlyweds, and so he wanted me right there inside Wright Patterson with him as he brought these Balkan warlords and war criminals to heal. Before I launch into that, I, I want to uh, just acknowledge the remarkable thing that Sharon, you have done here in creating such a community, and I, um, and the, there are so many other people that I've become friends with, thanks to you, and thank you for, for calling me back every year. It's become one of, the, one of my favorite rituals in, in my life, and, um, and, and I um, cannot think of a more meaningful way to, to honor my husband's legacy than, than to name a, a literary peace prize after him and of course to this year to to be able to present it to the singular talent that is John Irving is a particular thrill and it would make Richard very very proud <laughs> I have, uh, as, as I was listening and deeply moved by all of, all of the speakers, I, I have made an absolute mess of my remarks because I kept borrowing John's pen and crossing out stuff and writing stuff. So if I can make out what this is, um, it'll be a miracle, but let me try. <laughs> it'll be a shorter miracle than the one I originally intended to say because, um, because I, want to, I want to hear John, not, not me. Uh, he, he, John, John, of course, has, has expanded our vision and, and stretched it to embrace the quirkiest, most ferociously human and independent souls and made us love them as he does. Richard Holbrook, too, was a humanist. His brand of diplomacy was one human at a time, and his ultimate target in bringing these, these warlords to the peace table was, was the human psyche. He studied them. His, his diplomacy was, was not an institutional abstract concept. It was paying very close attention to the man across the table and observing him, and even he was, he, he's, his, his many dramatic eruptions have been theatrically portrayed, and I can tell you that those, those so-called eruptions were carefully rehearsed, because he rehearsed them with me. <laughs> and, and when he would hit a wall with, with Milosevic or Tujman or, or Izbegovic, um, he very often asked me to take them for a walk in that lovely parking lot outside, outside Wright Patterson where I circled and circled and circled and Richard's, Richard's uh, instruction to me was make them focus about their future and the future of their children and their grandchildren and let me tell you something, those guys were not interested in their grandchildren's future. They were interested in one thing, power and holding on to power. It was such an eye-opening experience for me to, to discover 
that, um, that people who make war should not be the people in charge of the peace. I think, I think, I think Richard and John, who unfortunately didn't know each other, but I think they would have really liked each other. John and I have known each other for a couple of, of decades, and um, I, I, I think that they both, I hope I'm right in this, John, I think they both feel that, that our country is, is built on a particular vision and not merely on power, that their, their America inspires and draws the dispossessed to our shores for a second chance. I hope it still does. I hope it still does. I, as, as, I, as I mentioned, Dayton is, is, is deep in my heart, and, and I, partly because, because I shared those, the most dramatic weeks of my life here in, in that fall of 1995, but, but also because, because I observed Dayton, the town, play its role for history because the town was very much, and, and Richard encouraged that, was very much involved in, in the entire process of, of making peace. And the reason Richard chose Dayton was because it was in the heartland, because it was middle America. He didn't want it to be in the, you know, one of those glittering, diplomatic settings that are usually chosen, Geneva or Vienna or Paris. He wanted this to be an American piece with Americans surrounding that base. He wanted those guys behind the barbed wire, but he wanted the town to be involved. And the town was, and through this, through this amazing uh, literary peace prize, which has now turned into an amazing network and a project, um, it has continued to play that role. And this afternoon, um, as I always do when I return uh, to Dayton, um, my, my good friend Matt Joseph, and this year I was accompanied by my, my beloved friend Kathy Lacey, we, we, uh, we went to all the pilgrimage points um, now there's a Holbrook Plaza, which makes me incredibly proud, and a Holbrook Bridge, and then of course we, we went to uh, we we went to Wright Patterson, and uh, and and there, I I relive as I do each year that that dramatic first night of the of the peace talks when when my husband seated me between between uh, Slobodan Milosevic and and Alia. Uh, is Begovic, two, two uh, mortal foes who, who just the week before had been literally gouging each other's eyes out or trying to. And Richard said, okay, Kati, your job is to make them talk to each other. <laughs> aye, aye, sir, said I. Um, and, and really for most of that, that dinner, they were all looking, pretending they, to ignore each other and looking in, in, in uh, diff off in the space in different directions and at the point of despair at, at, at not being able to fulfill my first diplomatic mission, um, I said uh, to just into the air to neither one, I said, how did this war start anyway? You know, like, like some idiot child. Uh, and at that point, they, e they each jumped in and started telling their version. And, and after a while, they forgot that I was sitting there, and, and Milosevic uh, said uh, to Izbegovic, Alia, do you remember the first time we met? It was in Tito's office. You were sitting on a green couch, and, and, and uh, Izbegovic said, yes, it was Muslim green. And they were off. And, uh, and, I, and I looked uh, uh, at the head table at, at, at my husband, and, and I went, and he went, <laughs> and uh, so like you, like Dayton, uh, I too played my small part for history. And, uh, and that was, as I said, the most, most rewarding chapter of my life. A few weeks after 
exhausting round-the-clock negotiations, because this was only the opening night. They signed the Dayton Accords, and the peace has held, how many years has it been? 23 years, not a, not a shot fired in anger in Bosnia. Thank you, Dayton. <laughs> But at, but at what price? 100,000 people were killed on the road to Dayton, and thousands of others have become refugees. But here in, Day here in Dayton, Richard said, and I quote, that the world's richest nation, one that presumes to great moral authority, cannot make worthy appeals to conscience and merely call on others to carry that burden. I wonder now, do we even call on others to carry a moral burden? I, I just want you to think about that. And I want to say a few strong words, if you'll allow me, about the present moment, because Richard, <clears throat> is no longer able to do so. But I can assure you that he would be on fire at the way the United States is abandoning values. Values, this is, this is not a political speech, I promise you. But those values are the ones that brought me and my family of refugees here. I came here not speaking a word of English, so I feel like I'm in very good company here because we all seem to be from someplace else. And this is, this is what makes America still different from any other countries. I was a small child in the late 50s. And for the two years prior to that, I had been separated from my parents prior to our escape, my journalist mother and father were called enemies of the people by Hungarian authorities. Tender-aged children, brutally separated from their parents, reporters who were called enemies of the people. <clears throat> Does that have a vaguely familiar ring? <laughs> but, but that was the Cold War. And my homeland was Soviet-occupied Hungary. But in retaliation to my parents' jailing, the Eisenhower administration <clears throat> cut trade and cultural ties with Hungary for the simple reason that reporters are not enemies of the state, but as essential for a democracy to thrive as oxygen. So when our president declares that the gruesome assassination of a journalist is no reason for us to stop selling weapons to Jamal Khashoggi's alleged assassins. And we know that those alleged assassins are using those weapons in Yemen to the most barbaric effect. We saw the pictures on the front page of the New York Times today. Those are the weapons that we sell them. Well, I think it's time, I think it's time, I think it's time for the least politically engaged to speak up. And, and, and we're not discussing politics here, we're discussing values. America in 1995 stood for its original values here in Dayton. It was not our weapons of mass destruction that silenced the guns and stopped the genocide of Muslims in Bosnia. Of course, there was the implicit threat of force, which, by the way, in a typical Richard maneuver, was well represented on that first night that I told you about, because we were seated under giant bombers in the hangar uh, at Wright-Patterson. And that was Richard's way of, of telling the, the Balkan chiefs that if diplomacy doesn't work, we have other tools to hand. But it was, but it was round the clock, painstaking, time-consuming diplomacy that, 
resulted in the Dayton Accords. And that kind of diplomacy is as human an enterprise as the great writing which we celebrate tonight. Dayton shared in a moment when America walked the walk of the values which, different, which differentiate us from any other power on earth. We can no longer take those values for granted. Richards, who, who's, Richard, whose diplomatic career began in, Afghanis, began in Vietnam and ended in Afghanistan, knew something about the extremely short distance between hot words and pipe bombs. He had experienced that in war zones. Let's pay attention to the power of the words we speak. Words have power, and we're seeing them in recent days. I have to say, as, as the grandchild of, of grandparents who, who I never knew because they perished in Auschwitz, I never expected to see the terrible thing that unfolded in Pittsburgh yesterday in America. The most meaningful way to honor Richard's memory is for us, all of us, to be on fire now, upholding those endangered values. Thank you so much for everything you do to do that. And <laughs> thank you. And thank you. Thank you. And finally, and finally, my 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 revered friend John Irving, congratulations on winning the Holbrook Prize.